literary roadhouse. Oh, sorry, did it not? No, it just did not. Yeah, you jumped the gun a little. Okay, we are live. This is Literary Roadhouse. One short story, once a week. I'm Rami. I'm Gerald. And I'm Anais. This week, we're reading a story called The 548, written by John Cheever and recommended by one of our previous guests on the show, Michael Laron. And the story chronicles a uh, life of maybe you can say a middle middle manager mid-level manager or some sort of executive at a company hires a secretary they have an affair fires her after this affair then is followed by the secretary sometime later and then held at gunpoint on a train which was the 548 and i won't spoil it for you so um things take place and the story concludes <laughs> Robbie, we always spoil the story no, <laughs> during the discussion that. see the thing is that. i really like gerald's um spoiler alert kind of warning where he says you know spoiler alert if you can do that too. Sorry, pause the show, <laughs> go back and read it, and come back. But I feel like I shouldn't do that because it's his thing. It's not so his I thing. Just, it's, it's, not, it's not my thing. thing. No. I just did it's it on the last episode. It's 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 it was in the script like from years ago. So all right, <laughs> fine. So not my thing. Go ahead and spoil it. So to continue, yeah. she holds him at gunpoint, and. Um, makes him get off at a station, um, tells him to kneel on the ground, then walks away to his relief. Afterwards, he dusts himself off, picks up his hat, and walks home. Okay. Hooray. See? Spoiling's fun. All right. <laughs> so, what did you guys make of the story overall? Gerald, do you always go I, first? I, yeah, I know. I liked this one. I, I, there was something about it straight away. I was, I, I was sort of in it, and and, and it was, it was just, it was just really, really well written story. Really enjoyed, really enjoyed. Even though, even though, even though it was broadly similar to the last, last week's story about a cheating man and and gets his comeuppance and all that sort of stuff, but 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 actually, it this one resonated with me far more, and I was. I just really enjoyed it. Mm. Gerald, just real quick, you're, you just did the robotic thing again. Your microphone did that. Oh, what? Really? Yeah. 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 It's, uh, is it maybe when your headphone wire touches the microphone wire? Is it a wire thing, maybe? Could be. Because it also happens to the track that you record locally, so it's not a bandwidth thing. Okay. Um, all right. And for those watching live, hello. <laughs> I keep looking down because I'm like doodling. <laughs> I just yeah. like, have it. Um, it might be a wire thing. Okay. Um, am I all right now? Yeah, yeah, you're all right now. Okay. Okay. So, Rami, what did you make yeah. of the story overall? Uh, I, again, I thought it was pretty good overall. Um, it does have strangely similar themes to the previous story we discussed. Um, but I like how it began by sort of throwing you in the action. I was a bit disoriented at first, not really sure what to make of it. Was it a real woman? Was it an apparition? Is this going to be some kind of ghost story or, so or something? But um, when it was fleshed out, it made sense. And, oh. and uh, yeah, I liked it overall. Mm. I liked it too. Um, yeah. I just liked it. And like you said, very similar themes to the one from last week. Um, down to the ending where we were saying last week how we felt that the character didn't learn anything. And I, I feel that way about this character as well. I think he's, you know, happy he dodged a bullet, but I don't think he's going to stop being the way that he is. And he's yeah. so unlikable. Yeah. He's such an unlikable character. Is he, isn't he just... Isn't mm. he just, but the, and, and he's so judgmental about even even you know not just women but judgmental about everything and everybody else 
yeah. around him. No one, no one matches him for you know. He's just so much better than everyone else. Right. Which is funny because, like, he's judging his neighbor, Mr. Watkins, because Mr. Watkins is wearing a corduroy jacket, which somehow breaks the sumptuary laws, <laughs> which he's confusing for, like, having morals. Like, just because you're wearing, like, a beige trench coat or whatever, and, like, you look a certain way doesn't mean that you're moral. And he's confusing those two things. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I quite, uh, uh, you know, from what Rami said, um, I quite liked the sort of mystery air of the woman that was, I, I I quite like that like that sort of air of intrigue that that Cheever brought into the story, and uh, and and there's so much, I love the detail that he brought into it too, and and having read last week's story again afterwards, I could see the same sort of detail, but I didn't think this is this is, I think basically what what it is 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 that is that John Cheever is is my sort of writer. Mm -hmm. He writes. He writes the way I, I enjoy um, enjoy reading. But I was going to say, go ahead, Rami. No, no, say what you were going to say. I was going to change. Just that there's a sort of noir quality to it, especially when she's mm. like chasing him through the city. That makes sense because that's the kind of stuff that you really like, Gerald. Mm. Yes, it is. Yeah, very good. I'd like to know what a Gibson is. I don't know what a Gibson is. Mm. Gibson. And I yeah, he goes. Jealous. He has, goes to a bar and, and has a Gibson, orders a Gibson. Yeah, what is a Gibson? You want to go Gibson? Tell us shortly. I will tell you, you know, I'm always Googling. While, while you're looking it's that It's a up. cocktail, oh. gin and dry vermouth, <laughs> garnished okay. with pickled onion. What? No. Yeah. Pickled onion. The oldest published recipe for a Gibson is found in 1908. Mm. Wow. Hey, I'm doing the quiz here. Oh, sorry. Well, I didn't have point. <laughs> Oops, I won't ask any more questions. No, that wasn't a quiz question, but it sounds like it, it could have been, been. yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, Robert, um, what were you going to say? Yeah. yeah, just since we were comparing and contrasting this story and the last one, I think talking about the male figures, it seems like Horace um, from A Rich Man would have learned more of a lesson perhaps than. The character in 540, yeah, in the 548. Why um, do you say that? The character in the 548 could have died. Was, there was a greater sense of loss. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, maybe that might generally trigger like a change in behavior versus, although traumatic, it seems like it was kind of a one day incident and now it's over. Mm. Yeah, I, I can still say that because, because the loss to the um, to Horace was yeah it was was more permanent, wasn't it? He'd lost mm -hmm. some of his records and his swords had been broken. Whereas this is just a temporary um, uh, temporary sort of embarrassment. So you would think he'd dust himself off and think, well, that was a bit crazy. But actually, I th I think I think he he would learn something from this, and he would think. He would, I don't know, maybe he'd learn to be a bit more careful about the women he had affairs with. I was going to say, just vet them a little more. Yeah. Well, so, so that's that's uh, another thing I wanted to ask is, what did you make of the woman's hospitalization? Did you think that she indeed had mental illness or was it just the symptom of, you know, the time that she was living in when maybe, well, I, I don't know exactly, you know, what the, latest you know research was at the time but there were instances where just any kind of um socially unacceptable behavior by a woman could be deemed as a type of mental illness or something mm -hmm. yeah i mean i think I'm, one of the reasons rami when you were saying that the horace from a rich man would probably learn a greater lesson than um What's this guy's character? What's this? We don't know his Blake. name. We never, huh? Blake. Oh, Blake. Blake. Blake yes. That's right. Blake. Yeah. Blake. Well, but is that that's his last name? I guess. Yeah, Mr. Blake's yeah. last name. Mr. Blake. Yeah. Yeah. But Mr. Blake, one of the reasons I thought you were going to say which you didn't was because he, the woman who pulls a gun on him, is portrayed as crazy. So it feels more like a one-off. Like, oh, don't, don't screw around with crazy people. And what you're saying is, was she actually crazy, or is this a symptom of a t of a 
more misogynistic culture that would um, institutionalize women for behave, you know, for behavior that wasn't crazy. I think Cheever would have signaled that more if that was a point he was trying to make. And I don't think that was signaled at all. I don't know. Yeah. Gerald, do you agree? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I, I after I'd, I'd read it, I looked at some, some reviews and analysis and, and a couple of them referred to the fact that they thought she was hospitalized because of the affair, but actually she says when mm -hmm. she's talking to him on the train, she says that she was in, she spent a lot of her life in in and out of hospitals. Oh yeah, um, and, and she even she even expressed it apparently when she was being interviewed. And that and in the story, it says Mr. Blake, among his regrets, was that he that didn't raise more of red flags for him when she had um, when she had admitted to that. I would. Do, I didn't. I didn't realize it. Mm. She mentioned it during the interview. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, interesting. I thought it was. I thought that was it. That or was it like the handwriting and other things that he thought were yeah, sim included. yeah, all of that, all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and the thing is, the fact that she is somebody who's been in and out of mental hospitals makes you want to dismiss this as almost an anomaly. As, but there's also a way in which is it only a woman who, um, like, would a woman in the mid century, mid twentieth century who had suffered the way that Miss Dent had, would they feel that they were able to do this? A little bit like her mental illness gave her the freedom to do something that other women would have wanted to do, that they wouldn't have risked um, their lives really to do it, right? Their, their livelihood, their jobs, their futures. Um, I don't know. My, my only grievance with not the story, but I guess a little bit like the way that the main plot was drawn out was the the fact that she was kind of so crazy. Her letter was so insane, addressing him as dear husband. Um, <laughs> it sort of detracts from the lesson that's meant to be learned here a little bit. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think so. And, and you know, to, to to Rami's point about him not learning a lesson, um, he, all he would do is is think about think that um, it was. Uh, yeah, she was a crazy woman, so you just have to be careful not to, not mm -hmm. to have an affair with a crazy woman again. Mm -mm. Yeah, which I think is unfair because I think, yeah. yes, she's a crazy woman, but she he did still prey on her. He did still make her, you know, um, cost her her livelihood. She can't get a job after this. Maybe some other reasons as well, but this is a big part of it. You know, she says that because she was let go, what three weeks later, um, that he poison the well the way oh. that he asked for her to be fired um but she walked away from this whole tense moment she was the only one who walked away with something she walked away with a little bit more self-respect which is a huge deal for her the one thing she kept repeating over and over and over was at the hospital they don't want to cure me they just want to take away my self-respect so getting some self-respect back and also feeling a little bit sane who would kill someone over this a crazy person. She chose not to, so she gets yeah. to walk away feeling a bit sane, like she has the higher ground. Um, so she actually walks away empowered. He walks away maybe with a fleeting moment of regret. Dirty knees. And, and, yeah, dirty and knees. And that, and that's the danger, isn't it? That that well, from the from the uh, from the reader's point of view, that the character doesn't learn to be less misogynistic, less judgmental. He just thinks, well, what a crazy woman and, and, and moves on. Mm -hmm. Um which which is you know not such not such a, but then it's not a parable. So Right. I think that's fine and so. realistic. Yeah, true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's not just in the way that he treated Miss Miss Dent. He was he's also horrible to his wife, right? Like he's estranged from her, estranged from his son, even he doesn't care about his son, who is like is increasingly over at the neighbor's house. Um yeah. and you know, the wife kind again, similar to Horace and Lanise from a rich man, living in the same house but completely separate lives, sleeping in separate beds. In this story, Mr. Blake built a bookshelf in the door that connects their two bedrooms. <laughs> like it's it's um He's just he's just so unlikable, like Horace. Like yeah. these these two stories are just so parallel. I'm yeah. glad we did them one after the other. It's funny, isn't it? It just just happened to be that way. Yeah, didn't, we didn't, didn't plan that. No. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, it, and he 
I mean, he, he didn't get on with his neighbours, he was very judgmental about those, and mm -hmm. they didn't like him. And, and it's, it, it seems, you know, at no point does he think, mm, maybe it's me that's, that's uh, you know, the, the, the wrong person here, the, the not nice person. He's just, no, he's, as, as Rami says, you know, he's this middle manager, um, and, and he thinks he's perfect. And again, like Horace, Horace is not a rich man. He's a middle-class man who thinks everything is owed to him. This guy, he's not a big deal. He didn't invent something. He didn't create some like monolithic company. He's a middle manager of some random ass company that isn't even worth naming, right? <laughs> like the entitlement that comes from mediocrity as well is just like astounding. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is. A, and, and it's, and it shows these people for, for, the the people they are you know it shows shows you how uh, and and you you meet people like this all the time and and you meet people who have some sort of status who think you know i've got a, i've got some status now i you know i wear a suit and um i'm in in management and and they they do nothing, mm -hmm. nothing. Mm -hmm. yeah and also yeah. he like hates Mrs. Compton, one of the other neighbors, because she's the woman who his wife complains to about him. Like, he doesn't ever stop to be like, why is my wife constantly complaining yeah. about me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe yeah. it's my behavior that's mm -hmm. questionable. Mm -hmm. well, but and, no. and the fact that he admitted that they sometimes intentionally hire secretaries that show low self-esteem. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he would always prey on women that had low self-esteem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's yeah. a predator. He's the worst. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. We don't mm -hmm. like him. It's funny. Yeah. I, I saw I saw references to um, uh, uh, Fatal Attraction, uh, I, and and you think, well, yes, but no. It, it's you know, it's similar in a way, but but in Fatal Attraction, she uh, Glenn Close is is the crazy woman who has this affair and and they won't let go. And mm. uh, and I thought, well, no, this this woman, yes, she's apparently got sort of mental health issues, but he's he's the bad person. He, the, you know, Mr. Blake is 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 the misogynist mm. um, who who you should feel no, um, because she, you know, with with um, Michael Douglas, you, you you think, oh crikey, yes, he that was wrong, but he look at the mess he's got into, and and there is some sympathy for him, I think. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, it also seems similar to Stone Mattress. I think this idea of men getting their comeuppance has been coming a lot in stories Ooh. recently and in real life. <laughs> it's everywhere yeah. oh, right now. Right, it's everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Burn true. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, so let's talk a bit more about the writing craft of it. So, like. One thing that I liked a lot that I caught more on my second read through is the storefront window he looks in and it's the um it's like a living room but the flowers are dead and the teacups are empty it's like this false empty front and it's like just such a good visualization of who he is he's seeing his reflection in it so you're seeing his it's his uh, body in front of this false front and he too is a false front he thinks that just because he has the tan trench coat and he's doing everything the way he's supposed to and he's living in the suburbs he's commuting by train in out of manhattan that's it but there's no depth to him there's no life there's no love he's just like this like entitled dry cynical empty thing right like he just he just like yeah he's yeah, I just he's empty in a way, like not in a not in a way supposed to be sympathetic with him in a way that he sort of did to himself. Uh, a lot of this sort of entitlement also comes from a sort of cynicism and a view of life, right? Because a guy who is not that way, he is finding depth, richness, and love in family and wife and children, right? He is mm. incapable of doing that. There's a sort of cynicism to that kind of person. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought that that I thought that was a a great line when and. and Beautifully described as, as well. Mm -hmm. you know, it was a decorator's or an auctioneer's. And and just a, earlier on the line, as he waited his turn at revolving doors, I just thought, yeah, you can you just picture that so well. Mm -hmm. That just that short line there. I, I, and I, I like all the way through that that Cheever did that really well. I think it just just a, a little bit of description which was sharp and focused, 
and, mm-hmm. but not over lyrical and, and just moved on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I loved Cheever the first time we read him on this podcast when we read The Swimmer. The Swimmer was so good. I think I like oh. The Swimmer better than I love the, I like this one, but The Swimmer I think I liked even more. And it has, it's just, yeah, the, the writing's masterful, but that's yeah. nothing new. I think people know that. Yeah. <laughs> I just changed my rating. Ooh, okay. I went up half a point. Why? No just because listening to Gerald talk about the rating and you talk about it as well. Did you also like the writing? Yeah, it's good. Mhm. Did the story feel long for you, or? Um. Kind of. I mean, I I'm not the right person to ask about. That. I was gonna say the reason I'm asking you specifically is because I think you're our most impatient reader. Oh. <laughs> like you're the one who's like you want to get to the point. You want to like learn the thing. So did it feel long for you, or were you sort of gripped throughout? Well, I, I also kind of judge that based on whether I read all the way through or j- pause and then come mm. back to it. Um, and this, I did pause, but again, I don't know how much that says about the story as much as it says about me or the state I'm in when I'm reading the story. So I, I recognize my subjectivity in all this too, or my, <laughs> yeah, my, my partiality. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's all subjective. I mean, it was as as short stories on that pod, on this podcast go. It was it was a substantial length. It was six thousand and something words, um, and yet it seemed to be much shorter than last week's story, um, "Rich Man." It seemed that seemed to go on and on. And although the the, the sort of second half of that story had good pace, it it, it just. I became aware of how long I'd been reading it, whereas with this this story, it was I, I finished it and I thought, is that it? Oh, like, you know, it seemed to go through very quickly. Mm. And I think part of that, both of them went quick for me. But I think this one, part of why it went quick was, as you were talking about earlier, Gerald, that mood, the intrigue, it kept you wanting to figure something out. Why is this woman chasing him down? Why is she angry? And the other story that we read last week, a rich man didn't really have the why aspect of it too much. It was just what happens next. Well, this one's like, wait, what happened? Who is this woman? You don't find out until fairly late in the story. There's oh. a secretary that he slept with and then fired the next day. Oh. So I, th- I, I, yeah, mm-hmm. and I, I like the fact that that you know she shows him the gun in a pocketbook and um, that that she's not joking and she's not making this up. She really has got a gun, and you think you just think, where's this going to end? What's what's she going to do? And, and I think I thought the ending was was fantastic. I Absolutely. kind of would have liked if there had been no gun. And I, I, I'm forgetting what movie it was, but someone kidnapped the woman with a Snickers bar and then they went on this whole car chase and ended up falling in love. But it would have been funny if she just threw the Snickers bar at him while he's on the ground and walked away. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. And also, I think it's funny that in his effort to evade her, he found... Uh, some solace in a men's bar where yes. I'm assuming she wasn't allowed to enter. So. Yeah, I, I, I didn't know such a thing existed that presumably it's men only bar. It's, yeah. it's... <laughs> mm. Wow. Looked out yeah. through the window. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, and yeah, I think she had to have a gun because if she didn't have a gun, she would have no leverage over him. Only the the gun's the only thing that made his tongue heavy in his mouth, made him a, made him completely cave in and fold on himself. All his big man bravado is gone. If yeah. she didn't have a gun, I think he would have gotten like when he's like, "I'm gonna move up and move into the next car." He would have done it. She didn't have a car. Mm-hmm. What you gonna do? Make a scene? Scream? To to, to still um, pretend you had the gun, but I think it would have been a bigger blow. A big, it would have been more mm-hmm. emasculating. If after mm. all that she never had a gun in the first place, mm. and he was just that. afraid of the possibility of her having, yeah, mm. yeah, but, I like but, how but, I like. Mm-hmm. Go ahead, Joe. Yeah, I was gonna say I like how in both stories the guys are immediately how quickly they're they collapse right with Horace. It's in the jail when somebody threatens to assault him, and then in this one it's a gun for good reason, but just like. 
how quickly the fight goes out of them, how yeah. they're only strong when they're preying on the weakest of the weak, right? Like in this case, he's specifically um, picking on women with low self-esteem. Yeah. 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 What were we going to say, Joel? Yeah, I, I just think about, about the gun. I, I think if he hadn't seen the gun, I think he, he would have probably called her bluff because I think he he already thought she was some crazy woman. So um, I, I think if, if she hadn't shown him the gun, he'd have just said, no, yeah, you're bluffing and, and moved on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Yeah, we are. Yeah, anything else? No, I like I like the story a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think sometimes it's a little hard to find more. Like, there is so much more to talk about, right? There, we already talked about the imagery with the um, with the display. I read some reviews, but I wasn't convinced about imagery in the ads. There was those three ads that kept repeating. That one that he oh, yeah. had put a rubber heel on her and now she was coming up the Hawaiian woman dancing and the couple toasting. I, I wasn't convinced by the imagery review that I was reading about those three ads um, that kept repeating, but I do feel like there has to be something there because they're repeating, but I have no idea what it is. I, I, I just wondered whether it was the, the, the monotony, it was the whole sort of bleak mm -hmm. environment and they, the, he made reference to, um, the sort of rundown nature of, of the places they were passing and, mm -hmm. and concrete and and the rain. So it was, it was everything was was this grey, bleak background. And, um, mm -hmm. and yeah, quite interesting that that he, he sort of brings out the um, the station master at where they get off and said they'd left the lights on and sort of interesting details. But but it seemed to fit. It doesn't. It didn't seem to slow the pace down at all. Mm. Yeah. And 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 the mood is very gray, like you said. It's very more, like I was saying, it just has like a very even even once the mystery, we know why she's there, but everything that happens after that, the way that she's threatening him, the gun to his belly, stand over there in the dark, get down. Like the whole thing is very um it's gritty. Yeah. Um and I think you're right about the monotony with the ads, because that is a Cheever thing that he likes to write about a lot. <laughs> the monotony okay. of suburbia. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. No, that's, that's good. It, it, uh, I love the whole atmosphere thing. I, I, all the way through, I was just so there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. okay. Anything the, else? The, the movie I was talking mm -hmm. about where um, someone kidnaps someone else with the candy bar is called The Chase, starring Ooh. Charlie Sheen. Mm. I don't think I've seen okay. that. Okay. One to look out for. Yeah, and it's funny. I don't think I've seen that. There's a lot of movies I haven't seen. Just yesterday, I was like going through Netflix, and my boyfriend was asking, "Have you seen this? Have you seen that?" And the movies I haven't seen is astounding. Um, really? So now we we have like a movie watching plan. I haven't seen No Country for Old Men, which you can't believe. Mm. Yeah, that's, I think I've seen it. Yeah, yeah, but there's a bunch on that list. Um, yeah. Anyway, or like it's weird. I saw Kill Bill Volume Two, but not one. <laughs> what? Wow, yeah. that's crazy. That doesn't I've never, yeah, yeah. <laughs> never even. I've never seen Goodwill Hunting. Just like. No, I haven't either. Burn after yeah, reading another one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I suppose there's yeah, there's a lot of fun. I mean, we we've we've had so this is totally off topic, but we we've had some great um, TV drama over here recently. Mm. Um, uh, uh, and my partner says, "Oh, have you been watching it?" No, I haven't seen any of that. So, so we have a huge list of, of things to catch up with, and and I saw the last episode of something that that there's like eight episodes for, and I thought, "Oh, I've got to catch up with the rest of that." Yeah, we have a list too, that yeah. for TV shows that we're working through. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> are we ready to rate? Okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, five and a half, just like last week. I like them both the same. Mm. Wow. Mm -hmm. I started with a five and I bumped it up to a 5.5 also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it's funny. I was just, I, exactly as Rami, I, I, I started at five and I went to 5.5 .5 and I thought, oh, this is, 5.5 is a bit good. You know, is it that good? But, but hearing both of yours, I thought, yeah, it, it is. Mm -hmm. There's no question about it. 5.5. .5, lovely story. Yeah. All right, it's game time. What are we submitting? And 
Ram used to win the game. Uh, I'll I'll go with um, uh, Kido by Haruki Murakami. Okay. And I'm submitting Occurrence at Owl Creek by Ambrose Bierce. Ambrose Bierce is an author that longtime listener Emily Craddock says that we need to read. Ooh. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, guess what the quiz is about? Uh, I have no guns, idea. rain, trains. Yes, trains. Trains. <laughs> trains, okay. trains no, just trains. Um, okay. And Gerald, I thought you'd like to know that I've tried to throw in a mix of US and UK relevant questions. Oh, thank you. That's very kind of you. Yeah. Well, I mean, and the fact that I think trains started in the UK, I think. Yeah, probably. Don't know. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, um, so who should we start with? Anais. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think we let's start with Gerald rather. Okay. Well, whatever. Okay. So whatever the first question is, he's trying to give it to based yeah. on whatever it is. Well, no, well, here you'll see why. It's because it's about something in the UK, mm -hmm. but then it's related to something NAUS probably knows more about. I'm, wow. I'm trying to help you out here, but I don't know who I should. Okay. Anyway, okay. Just ask the question. So I'll, I'll pick Gerald just okay. because you're showing up first on my screen. So no offense, NAUS, okay? All right, I'm taking all the offense possible. Yeah. No. <laughs> uh, Gerald. Uh, yeah. What train? Is the real Hogwarts Express train that was used in the movies called, and it actually it runs every day. Uh, is it the Atlantic Coast Express, the West Highland Line train, or the Brighton Bell B E L L E? Wow. Um, yeah, you you were right. It, it's UK, but maybe more NEs. Um, I will say purely because you spelt bell <laughs> the brighton bell no it's the west ah, island yeah i knew that got one me. yeah got me well done yeah all right and i use in what year did the miles of railroad track in the united states reach its peak was it 1916 1921 or 1932 1916. Yes. Oh, yeah. Bonus that year, there were more than 250,000 miles of track, enough to wow. reach the moon from the Earth. Wow. Wow. That's a lot of track. Ooh. All right, Gerald. Okay. Yep. Built in the UK in 1831 and named after a famous UK personification but put into operation in New Jersey, this is the oldest still operable railway steam engine in the world. Ran between 1833 and 1886, 1866, and it now can be seen in the Smithsonian Institute. What is, it, what is its name? Fred Smith, Jamie Oliver, or John Bull? I, I would guess John Bull. And you would be correct. Hooray! Yep. All right. Uh, and I use. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Built in 1829, this little engine beat out four other models in trial runs and achieved a top speed of 24 miles per hour. With a huge smokestack in front and pistons um, to drive the wheels, it looked as unusual as its design, and it operated between Liverpool and Manchester. And it was called by what name? Rocket, steamship, or airplane? What? Okay, rocket, steamship, or airplane? It had, it had, well, yeah, it just, it had a top speed of 24 miles per hour. I don't know, steamship? Nope, it was called the rocket. Stevenson's rocket. Going at a blistering 24 miles per hour. No. Okay. Mm. Okay. 
All right, let me just keep track here. Um, I think we're one one right now. Yeah, you're right. Oh, okay. So there's a tiebreaker though. So in case both of you get it or don't, um, Gerald. Oh no, let me see here. <laughs> Fine, I'll just go in the way it was. In what year was the first Continental Railroad completed? 1854, 1869, or 1901? 1854. No, 1869. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's see. Okay, so th is this the last question for Anais? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, this is why I should have searched. Okay, Anais, this British civil engineer is credited with inventing the steam engine for trains. What's his name? George Stevenson, Robert Lowell, or Alexander Porter? The second one, Lowell? Yes, correct. Wow. Woohoo! I wouldn't have got that. Anais wins. Very okay. good. Oh. That was a guess. Don't be so impressed. Oh. <laughs> All right, wait. Bonus question for who anyone wants. According to CSX, a leader in freight transportation, trains can move a ton of freight nearly 450 miles on how many gallons of fuel? 10, 1, or 25? A ton of freight. It's got to be the 25. Yeah, 25. That's what I thought too. It's actually one. No. What? Yeah. Wow. Very really good. Yeah. Wait, the, so there's this, that wasn't the, the tiebreaker though. This okay. is the tiebreaker and I just really like it. So I want to share. Okay. So Japanese trains are known for their sharp time schedule. If a train is even five minutes late, the passengers get an apology and the certificate that they can show at work to prove that they were delayed because otherwise nobody would believe them. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. On the rare occasion that Japanese trains are one hour late or more, it can even make the news. So what was, what would you, based on the information I just gave, what was the average delay of a train in Japan in 2012 in time? Four minutes. No, I, I, I would say something like 10 seconds. Mm, and Gerald would be closer. It's 0.6 minutes. What the hell? Yeah. <laughs> wow. They are, they are incredibly punctual. I've, been, I've, I've worked in Japan, and, and they're amazing. And, mm -hmm. and, and they, on the platform, they have little marks where the doors will be, and the doors are there. They're, they're just, it's wow. fantastic. Wow. Yeah. I always have to guess where the doors are going to be in the subway. Yeah. yeah. All right. So next week we are reading Occurrence at Owl Creek by Ambrose Bierce. But before you go, I need to scroll down to my story. No, but before <laughs> you go, hop on a train to our comment section at literaryroadhouse.com and leave your thoughts on this story. Other stops on the Common Express include our Twitter at Lit Roadhouse and our Facebook group for fans, the Literary Roadhouse readers. Join us wherever you like. As I said last week, Again, we recommend you avoid philandering and instead take up reading. Trust us, no one puts a gun to your belly for reading. And we can help you develop the, ha the reading habit. Join the Literary Roadhouse Book Club where we discuss a... Where were that? Join the Literary Roadhouse Book Club where we discuss full fiction novels. You can see which books we're reading by visiting literaryroadhouse.com slash books. Also, we confess, we like to splurge on corduroy jackets, just like Mr. Watkins. We just love the corduroy. We are heathens. Help support our corduroy habit and podcast expenses by making a contribution at patreon.com slash literary roadhouse. Every bit helps. And as always, share this podcast with the homicidal secretary in your office. Until next time, read a good story. That's good advice.